buenas tardes. Ok, uh, voy a comenzar rápidamente porque tengo mucho para decir <laughs> en inglés, desafortunadamente. Uh, so this is not exactly the same title that uh, was advertised, but it's more or less the same. <laughs> and um, what I want to uh, really discuss is not so much just the timing constraints of the boundary, but something about the actual event. I mean, that's what we are interested in. So to begin, I would like to acknowledge that uh, many people have contributed to the work that I'm going to show you. Uh, people at many different institutions uh, in many countries, uh, mostly in the U.S., my colleagues at the University of California in Berkeley and also Berkeley Geochronology Center, but also some colleagues from the Netherlands, um, Florida International University, Scotland, some more people from Berkeley, and so on and so forth. And uh, I want to also acknowledge some funding support from the National Science Foundation and a private uh, source from the University of California. So I appreciate the help of all these people and without their uh, collaboration, this would not be possible. So of course, uh, when we talk about the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, we're talking about one of the most significant mass extinctions in the history of the Earth. And this is a very classic uh, depiction of major events in Earth history from the Cambrian through recent times showing major decreases and some increases in this case in the diversity of fauna, in this case marine fauna, at the um, level of families. And um, so great reductions in diversity typically are uh, interpreted as mass extinctions. But the most recent of these five significant decreases in diversity is the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Now many ecologists and biologists uh, tell us today that we are beginning the sixth mass extinction in Earth history. Um, and uh, we won't be around to see the, uh, the end of that, presumably, but uh, uh, it's just important to keep this in mind. So this is the one, of course, that I'm going to focus on today. Now, of course, everybody in this room knows about the impact of a large bolide or meteorite uh, or meteoroid because by all accounts, according to all the evidence we have, this happened in Mexico. Um, and the question really has been debated for many, many years as to whether, whether or not this is the only cause of the mass extinctions at the end of the Cretaceous, whether this same process has been important for these other four mass extinctions. Um, and just to summarize the, the evidence, at least as I perceive it, the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction is the only one that has very clear evidence for an impact occurring at right about the exact time as the extinctions. None of the other big ones have uh, anything nearly as clear evidence. I mean, in this case, we actually have the Clady in Chicxulub. So um, it may be a special case, it may not be. But um, this is the, the context. And of course, whoops. Um, I just want to remind people of a little history of, of how this the Cretaceous tertiary um, impact was, was first developed, how this theory was developed. Um, long before the discovery of, Ch of Chicxulub, it was uh, this father and son who were both in Berkeley um, who discovered that right at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary as defined by uh, micropaleontology in a place called Gubbio, Italy, um, there were some rather dramatic changes that occurred across this boundary. And I'm sure many of you in this audience know uh, this story, but I'm just going to give an overview just for those who may not. Um, so right at the boundary, um, which is defined in this case by a very thin layer of clay, this is the same one I just showed. And at the thin section scale, you can look at the foraminifera below the boundary. So this is the latest Cretaceous and this is the earliest tertiary. 
and you can see that there's a profound difference in uh, the size of the foraminifera, the diversity of the foraminifera, the ornamentation, and fundamentally, the surface to volume ratio of the foraminifera. Um, they're much more ornate and they require uh, relatively special conditions to precipitate calcite to, to uh, develop these kinds of tests or exoskeletons. Whereas the diversity and size and surface to volume ratio profoundly decrease. So this suggests that there's some profound chemical oceanographic change that occurs very abruptly at the boundary. And of course, as everybody knows, um, right at this location, there was a significant peak in iridium concentration, which was interpreted in, the, in 1980, I believe, uh, as the signature of a very large extraterrestrial body because iridium is not known in anything nearly these concentrations in any terrestrial reservoir. So um, this was not actually, I mean, this result that I'm showing right here was uh, published in 1987, but the, the actual phenomenon was discovered much earlier. Okay, so that's a little bit of history. Um, also, soon afterwards, the discovery of shock quartz, that is quartz with these planar deformation features, uh, these lamellar bands were discovered, which was clear evidence of high pressure, very rapidly applied um, metamorphism at various locations. And of course, soon after, as most of you know, the chick's lid structure was discovered in the northernmost part of the Yucatan Peninsula. And um, so all of this evidence was converging in the, in the 1980s through the earliest 1990s. And um, the, the impact theory for, for the mass extinctions became extremely popular and really um, became widely accepted theory. Now at the same time, there was um, a very small number of geologists who believed that it was really the eruption of a very large flood basalt province in India called the Deccan Traps, which is shown here, <coughs> that was responsible somehow for the mass extinctions. And um, this theory had been proposed as early as the late 1970s, but as the evidence for the Chicxulub impact became more and more clear, uh, the volcanic hypothesis really just uh, really lost ground. And um, even though artists continue to depict volcanoes as being important, for a while um, this idea really um, lost favor. Well, since then, starting in the, let's say, early 1990s um, until today, the empirical evidence has grown that many major mass extinctions in Earth history, um, not just the big, the big five events like the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, the Permo-Triassic boundary, um, but many other significant oceanographic events, ocean, oceanic anoxia events, and so forth, coincided with these major flood basalts. And the most profound extinctions correspond essentially one-to-one -one with major flood basalt activity. So by, um, by about the year 2000, it was very clear that flood volcanism was an important factor in many major mass extinctions. And that, in a way, um, led people to speculate about the relative importance of the Chicxulub impact versus flood volcanism. Because we have a, a very good correlation between flood volcanism and extinctions for these previous events. And then we have a coincidence at the KP boundary as well. In addition, we have Chicxulub. So what does this all mean? Um, and that's kind of what we're after here. Um, in terms of mechanisms, I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, this great big pile of volcano, um, well, of lavas essentially, coincides with an extinction. What does that tell us about the actual mechanism? Well, the possible mechanisms for volcanism can arise from either of two different categories 
for volatile emissions. One would be the um, greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and water, principally CO2. And another completely different mechanism from sulfate aerosols, which increase the albedo of the earth if they get into the upper atmosphere and can induce cooling. And with cooling comes all kinds of other things. Um, it's a very complex interrelationship. So global cooling can cause regression because of accumulation of ice at the, at the polar um, regions of the earth and in continental ice sheets. That in turn can induce destabilization of clathrates, oxidation of continental shelves, Sulfate aerosols are sort of self-limiting because ultimately they produce acid rain. That feeds back into oxidation of continental shelves. And these then both in turn release greenhouse gases. So the cooling effects ultimately can produce warming effects and they can be self-limiting. And all of this um, working together could produce a significant um, series of climatic events which um, would have slightly different time scales. And it's very well known that the um, albedo effects and the cooling effects of sulfate aerosols are much more rapid in, in their time scale than the greenhouse effect. So one would expect a cooling event followed by a warming event and so forth. So this was, these ideas are, all of these have been invoked to uh, explain how volcanism on a very massive scale can cause ecological perturbations which in turn cause mass extinction. Yes. Hypercapnia is um, it's a poisoning by CO2. It prevents uh, the precipitation of calcium carbonate. Uh, yeah, it's uh, not a very common one. <laughs> um, <coughs> now, unfortunately, all of these possible mechanisms can also be caused by an impact event. Every single one of these. Uh, it depends really on the nature of the impactor uh, but more importantly, perhaps, on the nature of the target rocks. And in the case of Chicxulub, with the abundance of both carbonates and evaporites, you have a large source of both sulfur and greenhouse CO2. So <coughs> even if all of these mechanisms are were in fact important, they don't distinguish between those two events. Oh, this is uh, just a reminder. Over here, um, notice that the, um, the carbon producing mechanisms would tend to produce relatively heavy isotopic carbon. And so these are very clearly possible sources of the negative um, carbon isotope anomaly that's observed typically at the KT boundary and in other boundaries as well. Um, so one of the things that one should think about given that, that a, um, one of the significant signatures of the global cooling aspect of all of these mechanisms is regression. And to evaluate that, we look at some of the estimates for um, global sea level over time. And you'll notice that <coughs> according to some of these, um, notably the Talon curve, the, there is a profound drop in sea level right at KT time. There's another one right at the Permo Triassic and uh, another relatively small one at the Jurassic Triassic and one at the Cretaceous Jurassic. So it seems that sea level changes are in fact closely correlated with these mass extinctions. But again, that could be explained either by natural volcanism or impacts in the right kinds of rocks or both. So we haven't really learned anything about what what was the dominant um, effect. And um, this continues to be a very actively debated topic. And one symptom of this is, uh, first of all, a paper that was published two years ago in Science that was a review paper on the, I guess it was the uh, 30th anniversary of the first publication. And you can see this, this paper basically reviewed all of the evidence for an impact origin of the mass extinction and um, didn't really present any new data, but it summarized lots of, of data 
and there are actually 40 authors of this paper, two of whom are in this department. Um, now, this paper um, triggered multiple comments. There were three different comments that were published on this paper. I don't know how many more were submitted, but Science chose to publish three. And um, this one, which was dominantly composed of paleontologists, if not entirely, no, not entirely, because here's Van Sant Cordia, um, argued for um, the, ca the, the chicks lube impact being not the sole cause, but perhaps a contributor. There were multiple causes, and so forth, um, possibly the Deccan traps. Um, this one said that the Deccan traps were really the most important cause, and basically this one said the same thing. So the point I'm trying to make is that this is still a very actively debated topic. Uh, there's just by numbers, there are more authors on this than these combined, but I'm not sure that's really representative. So um, it's, it's still debated and um, therefore still interesting. So this is a, a, a figure from the Schulte et al. paper, just summarizing the evidence for um, an impact in the, in the Gulf of Mexico region. Um, there's a clear progression of proximal versus distal impact signals as you move away from more proximal sites to more distal sites. And I'm not going to go into any detail here. They also showed data from a couple of deep sea um, uh, drilling cores um, showing, among other things, and the one, one point I want to bring your attention to is this carbon isotope anomaly. Again, a negative anomaly right at the KT boundary of about two per mil or one and a half per mil. And it seems to occur very rapidly. And um, then it starts drifting back on a time scale of something like, well, about two million years if you look at the data above here. So a very, very rapid input of, of um, anomalous carbon and a very slow uh, recovery. Is the, is the basic point I want to make here. Okay, so meanwhile, um, there has been a very active campaign led by Gerda Keller at Princeton, who is arguing that the KT boundary, um, in fact, does not coincide with the Chicxulub impact, that the Chicxulub impact occurred 300,000 years before the KT, and she concludes that there was another impact of KT time, which is responsible for the iridium anomaly and presumably the shock quartz and so forth, but it wasn't Chicxulub, and she's unable to identify where that is. And this, this uh, idea is more than 10 years old, and uh, Keller and various colleagues continue to publish uh, papers making this assertion. And this is very, very controversial stuff. I mean, if you ever go to a a session at a conference where Gerda Keller and somebody else are, are presenting uh, results and ideas, you have to be very careful not to get hit by <laughs> flying body parts. It's vicious. So anyway, the, the what I want to uh, emphasize here is that 300,000 years is a long time, and we should be able to test that. That's actually testable, because we can resolve 300,000 years geochronologically. So you can probably guess now that I'm going to address that question. Let me point out that her, that Keller's analysis or conclusion that there was a difference of 300,000 years is based on biostratigraphy and the assumption that the biostratigraphy is well calibrated, uh, which is open to question. So people often ask, where does, where does this 300,000 years come from? And that's, that's what it is, it's foreign manipulo Biostratigraphy. Okay, so meanwhile, um, I want to talk a lot more about tektites in a, in a while, but one of the strong pieces of evidence um, linking the Chicxulub structure to the impact is the presence of these microtektites, um, especially concentrated near Chicxulub in this reconstruction for 65 million years ago. Um, these, of course, are um, impact melt droplets 
In this case, um, there's a, an alteration rind of smectite clay around the core of still fresh glass, which is effectively, this is volcanic glass um, because it, it's a silicate melt that cooled from, from a magma, essentially. The magma just happened to have been generated by impact. And there have been various geochemical and isotopic analyses of these tektites that show um, that they are pretty clearly associated with the kinds of rocks that are found in the six year debris. And um, they're, they're quite heterogeneous. There are various, um, anything from basaltic composition like this one to very, very calcic, unlike any volcanic uh, magma or any magma known. So they're, they're distinctive chemically um, enough to disprove the notion that some people have raised that they're volcanic in origin. And they occur right at the KT boundary. Keller um, asserts that they're, that they're present below the KT boundary, but other people believe that this is based on fault repetition of sections and um, incorrect Contact stratigraphic conditions. Is no longer being recorded. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so these tectites are, are important parts of the story. Um, the way that I came into this whole story was really because we were um, working on an astronomical calibration of the argon argon system a few years ago. And to test it, we took existing data for the age of the KT boundary and compared it to an astronomical tuning model based on a section in Spain, which gave an age for the KT boundary of. 65.957 plus or minus 0 0.040 million years. And by comparison, um, one gets an age of 65.99 plus or minus 0.12 from Swisher et al. Um, 1993. But that's not actually the age that is most close to the KT boundary for comparison. The age that actually um, comes closest to the KT boundary is this unit right here. It's called the Iridium Z coal, and I'll show you more about that in a minute. But it actually turns out to be significantly older than the KT boundary. And to look further into this, I'm going to take you now to an area in the northwestern part of the United States. Um, this is the Canadian border. This is the state of Montana. And this is the Williston Basin, so-called, where um, the contact between the Cretaceous and the tertiary um, strata are represented by this interface right here. So there are really significant exposures of the KT boundary all through this area. And this is where um, this, this best date for the KT boundary comes. And this is uh, a picture of the stratigraphy there. This is the tertiary above this dark layer. And this is the Cretaceous below. This dark layer is a lignite, a coal bed, which has um, volcanic ash in it. And that's what was dated to date the KT boundary. And um, Swisher and others dated a number of volcanic ashes in coal beds, which are given these numbers or these names here. IRZ for iridium Z coal and a number of these other ones, just alphabetical. Um, and basically, the age as a function of stratigraphic height is shown here. And what's what drew my attention to this is, again, this age for from right at the KT boundary as defined by both the iridium layer and um, pollen and the last appearance of dinosaurs seems anomalously old. And in fact, if you look at this whole section in terms of the sediment accumulation rates, which are shown in these red bars at this scale, uh, this would imply that right after the KT boundary, there was a very, very slow rate of sediment accumulation, which would normally imply an arid climate, um, very low sediment input, low erosion rates which is not really consistent with what you would infer about the paleoclimate in this area. And um, it makes it a little confusing. So for these 
several reasons I've mentioned, I became very suspicious of this, this age for the KT boundary. Moreover, <laughs> if you compare that age for the KT boundary with the previous existing data from the argon-argon system, all of this is argon-argon data, from melt rocks that were fr recovered from drill fours in the Chicxulub crater, or tektites from Haiti, um, both of these give indistinguishable ages. But this KT boundary, the best, best approximation for the KT boundary was significantly older by about 180,000 years, plus or minus 60, uh, 65 or 71, depending on what you're comparing with. So that's, that's resolvably different. And it's different in the opposite sense of what Gerda Keller has been saying. In this case, the KT boundary occurs before uh, these events. So this is the third reason why I became um, suspicious that there's something wrong or that, that this at least needed to be tested for. Now most people have assumed that the KT boundary ages and Chicxulub and the Haitian tektites are all identical and if you look closely at papers that link all these phenomena together, they'll say, well, the ages are very, very similar and so forth. But I take these kinds of data very seriously and this says they're different. So this is really not a game of, of almost. It's, we're trying to be quantitative here. So going to Montana with some of my students and colleagues, this is just an example of, of some of these various lignite coal deposits which have a number of tephras in them. Here in this one coal bed, you can actually count eight different tufts just in this one meter thick coal deposit. So there's a lot of opportunity for dating these coals much more precisely than has been done. Um, and one has to be a little bit careful because these coals in some cases bifurcate. So this one, there's two here and they merge, form one, and then it pinches out. Now, a lot of people have used these coal beds as regional stratigraphic markers. <laughs> you have to be very careful about this. Um, that's not really a problem for, for what I'm going to say today. So we focused um, on two sections in this area, um, both of which contain iridium anomalies that are well documented, not huge. Um, and these are two distinct coals. This IRZ coal has the... Has the um, iridium anomaly within the coal itself and just a centimeter or so below uh, volcanic ash, this, this same horizon at another location only one kilometer away, and you can follow it here, has an 11 ppb iridium anomaly, which is quite, quite large. Um, okay, so what's shown here are coals in black, um, siliciclastic sediments in white, I mean, sorry, in gray, and then tufts or tephras in white. So there's two tephras within the so-called Z coal, one very thin one in the IRZ coal, and then two more in this, in this upper coal over here. And um, one of the points that I want to make here is that both of these sections also contain a carbon isotope anomaly, which is constrained to be within this stratigraphic interval at a maximum. So the number of data points are fairly sparse, but the bounding, the lower baseline values and the maximum values um, define a maximum stratigraphic range for this carbon isotope anomaly, which is, again, about 1.5 per mil, so the same magnitude as elsewhere um, in these two sections. Okay, so what we've done now, here's a picture of one of these sections um, here's the IRZ coal. You can't even see the, the ash there. Here's this upper coal. These are separated by about 18 meters. And here's a close-up of my colleagues, uh, Alan Bruno and Jan Smit, having a little picnic on the IRZ coal. He here's what it looks like in detail. Um, unfortunately, I didn't put anything for scale in here, but this is about two millimeters thick, and just below, this is the, the ash within this coal, 
just below this, right here, there is um, a layer that contains tropical Brazilian wheat meal and it also contains corn syrup. And this is the corn syrup. So this is pretty certain that we have the right and it's just a matter of time that it does. This is why using this is so helpful. It's such a great opportunity to date the, uh, the boundary. This is the other section um, where we have another coal, a little bit thicker here, and several ashes within this same coal. And from these ashes, we separate the mineral sanidine, which is a nice high potassium mineral and is capable of yielding really the most precise argon-argon data one can hope for. And by very carefully controlling the irradiation of the samples, um, and that is by, um, in one case, putting samples, um, this in this case, tektites, and one of the Z coal cups bracketed by three different standards, and in this case, the IRZ bracketed by four standards. So looking at the scale, you can see that we have standards within um, really uh, uh, millimeters of the sample. And in this case, we have standards that bracket the samples and we actually use a, a um, multivariate fit to the, to the results to get a very precise J value. That's the point. So if you, if you calibrate the sample very, very densely with standards, you can increase the precision. And that's, that's what I was trying to communicate here. So here are the results. Um, we've also done limited uranium lead dating of some of these units. So this, this upper coal, the HFC coal, yields these results from single zircon um, uranium-238 lead-206 dates. These are with two different tracer solutions. This one obviously yielded much more precise results because it has a lower comma lead correction. And then all the rest of the data I'm going to show you are argon-argon results. So this, these argon-argon data are from single sanitine crystals from the same unit as this one. And you can see that the results are absolutely indistinguishable. And this is further validation of the, the calibration that we used here for the argon-argon data. And then um, multiple analyses, 70 uh, single crystals for this other um, cup in the Z coal, 70 out of 70 here. This, this one had a couple of xenocrysts, or one xenocryst here that is removed from consideration. So these are all from, from tufts that overlie the Kufi boundary. And um, here are a number of analyses from the KT boundary itself. And these were done in various ways. Um, these results were done by colleagues in Glasgow at the um, Scottish University Research Center. And then the rest of these are all done in my laboratory, but they're done on different samples of the same tuft from slightly different localities within 100 meters of each other. Um, different separations, different irradiations, different analysts, and we get very consistent results um, no matter what procedure was used. In this case, the grain size of the sanities was a little bit finer, so the precision of the individual measurements is lower, uh, but the result is still the same. Um, and we've also done some incremental heating analyses. Since some of these tufts we can show have no problem with xenocrystal contamination based on all the single crystal results, we can combine multiple crystals and step heat them. And um, um, of, of special interest is the results from the IRZ coal or the KT boundary, which are indistinguishable from the single crystal results. So we have really an amazing amount of data um, about 500 measurements here total for the KT boundary. And you may have already noticed, but those results for the KT boundary are quite a bit different than the ones that were previously reported. So I've now converted um, the original data of Swisher et al. to a more recent calibration of the argon-argon system. And um, our results are shown in red or argon-argon results, and you can see that they're quite a bit younger than the previous results, 200,000 years younger than the previous results. Um, 
here, we also have added data for, for new um, coals. This one was not previously dated. Notice that these are all significantly younger than the previous data. Um, in this case, we're a little bit older, and this is actually both the argon-argon and uranium lead data, just right on top of each other. Um, in other cases, there are slight differences at the one sigma level, but at two sigma, they're indistinguishable. And we have another new date now below the KP boundary. So we've shown that not only are the, um, the previous results from the KT boundary itself significantly um, in error, but a lot of the other ones are too. And whereas you could make a simple story about an acceleration of sedimentation rates after the KT boundary, now it looks a lot more complicated. And um, you have to think about ac sediment accumulation histories that are discontinuous, um, implying um, erosional or disconformities at various places in the section, which is not surprising at all. These are terrestrial sediments, and this is really the expectation. But whatever the case, we have this interval very well constrained. And um, now, to compare with the age of the KT boundary, we have gone back and dated more of these Haitian tektites because the previous results um, were reasonably precise, but we wanted to make this test at the highest possible level of precision. So we dated some more of these tektites, and this shows the age spectra for 14 individual tektites measured individually. And um, one of the things you'll notice is that the calcium-potassium ratios, which we get from the argon isotope data, have a very wide variation from one tektite to another. And this is consistent with the various geochemical studies that have been performed on these tektites. And they're known to be compositionally heterogeneous because the target rocks are compositionally heterogeneous. But despite the variation in composition, they give very systematic, consistent ages with every one of them, but except one, giving 100% plateaus. That is, every step in the age spectrum defines a plateau. And the one that is not has only a very small step in the early um, stages that, that wasn't important. So we've added to an existing database for the tektites. This is what they look like in terms of the plateau ages for our new results. This is what the average of our results is. And here I'm showing the age uncertainty without considering systematic sources of error, like from the decay constants or the standards. This is just analytical error. And this is if you include all sources of systematic error. So this is the absolute age uncertainty. So that's just for these 14 tektites. Now we can combine our data for these new data for the tektites with those from two previous studies. And you can see that they all agree within their uncertainties. And the weighted mean of all of those uh, is this. So you can probably guess, now we're going to compare all the data, our new data plus the previous data for the tektites, previous data for the Chicxulub melt rock itself from the crater, and our new data from the IRZ coal, which is extremely precise. And we can now say that the KT boundary, the difference between the KT boundary and Chicxulub is 6,000 years plus or minus 27,000 years. So it's indistinguishable. And this could also be uh, stated to say that the Chicxulub um, impact differs by no more than 33,000 years from the age of the KT boundary. So this is pretty satisfying and it really obviously um, cements the notion that the KT boundary and the Chicxulub impact were synchronous to within you know, the very best that we can do with, with current technology. There are a couple of other interesting points that come out of this. One of them is that if we take our new high precision data and apply just a simple linear interpolation between the dated units and the maximum stratigraphic extent of the carbon isotope anomalies, we can infer what the duration, the maximum duration of those carbon isotope anomalies are. And from this one section, we get a maximum duration of five plus or minus 3,000 years 
This one is 13 plus or minus 13,000 years. So um, very brief, but a little bit different than the marine isotope record in that in the marine record, the initial decrease in carbon del carbon 13 and partial recovery occurs on the same time scale, a few thousand years, or at least as far as we can tell from various means um, sedimentation rates and marine records, which is not very good, of course. But nonetheless, there's an initial event, decrease and then partial recovery that's very rapid on a time scale comparable to what we see in the terrestrial record. But then a much slower um, recovery, and in this case, uh, this is the time scale that's been referred to this, by the way, in thousands of years. Um, the, the full recovery occurs off this scale, on the time scale of a couple million years, both here at uh, the Agos section in Spain and also from the Parada section in Italy. Um, you don't even see the recovery on this time scale. So it's an interesting comparison that the terrestrial record, which is pretty clearly the atmospheric signal, the atmosphere suffered a very rapid input and a very rapid recovery, and the marine record does not. And that's very interesting because the marine carbon budget basically dominates the atmospheric budget. I mean, the, the ratio of masses is such that um, uh, whatever is happening in the oceans basically buffers what's happening in the atmosphere, unless there's something very peculiar going on in the ocean. And so, um, this probably means, and this has already been interpreted for the marine carbon isotope anomaly, that ocean circulation was disturbed for a long time, on the order of two million years or so, such that bottom water and surface waters were not communicating, and therefore the, the deeper oceans um, were unable to actually contribute to the atmospheric signal, or vice versa. So they were isolated. Um, yeah, and this is just meant to illustrate that this, this record also shows the same thing, a very rapid decrease and a partial recovery, but a much longer term full recovery. Okay, so um, one of the things, so we've established that the KT boundary and the Chicxulub impact were synchronous to the very best of our ability to tell these things. Now, most of you say, well, so we knew that, so what? <laughs> but we didn't know that. Actually, we just didn't know that we didn't know that, if you see what I mean. Um, now we know it. Um, but there's uh, some other things that have to be borne in mind. And one of these is illustrated by this um, stratigraphic composite section through the Williston Basin, where the um, boundary between marine and non-marine sedimentation is shown by this, oops, this line here. And so these are marine deposits and these are non-marine. This is east and this is west. There was an inland sea in this area of, of North America at the time. And so each of these zones represents a trans, I'm sorry, a regression and then a transgression, regression, transgression, regression, transgression, and so on. And here's the KT boundary at least according to the authors here. And um, in this region, they don't have reliable iridium anomalies, so this is based on biostratigraphy. But um, let's assume that it's correct. The point is that there were some significant um, regressions and transgressions right around the KT boundary. And that's one thing to keep in mind. The other is that the paleobotanical evidence from the same basin shows um, basically what they've done here is estimated the mean annual temperature from botanical assemblages as a function of age. And you can see that there are some very significant swings in temperature. I think there's a total of six major shifts in temperature, including a very significant decrease in temperature just before the KT boundary. So 
It's not clear whether this is a local phenomenon or how global it is, but at least at the local scale, it's pretty clear that there were significant climatic events, both in terms of sea level um, and in terms of, of temperatures estimated from paleobotanical assemblages, um, just before the KP boundary. So my conclusion is that in some ways, I think that Gerda Keller and company do have a point to make. Their point is that they think that the KT boundary um, was really triggered in, in most part by one of the phases, one of the pulses of volcanism that are now understood to have occurred in the Deccan Traps. The Deccan Traps, based on um, secular variation analysis, mainly by uh, the French group in Les in Paris, has documented that very well. And um, their Keller et al.'s point is that the middle phase of these three pulses is what triggered the KP boundary. And um, whether or not that's true, I think that remains completely um, undocumented. But some of the precursory climate effects that we see before the KP boundary may well have been caused by the initiation of the Deccan traps. The problem is that it's really impossible at this point to evaluate the role of the Deccan traps or the possible role of, of the Deccan traps in this whole story because the geochronology is so poor. And this is the kind of uncertainties that we face where you can see error bars for these various units within the Deccan traps, which are on the order of um, a million meters or more. And with that sort of precision, we just cannot possibly place the Deccan traps or any of the pulses of the Deccan traps into this context. So they may have been contributors to precursory phenomena that made the ecosystem, the global ecosystem, all the more vulnerable to the effects of an impact, but we don't know at this point, unfortunately. Um, so I have sort of two, two levels of conclusions. One of them is the obvious one, that the, the impacts in the boundary are synchronous, and it's hard, <laughs> in fact, I would say impossible, to dismiss this as coincidence. We know that the Chicxulub impact did not initiate Deccan vul volcanism, which was clearly already underway. Um, some people believe that even today, but it's, it's obviously not true. The carbon isotope, um, the atmospheric carbon cycle perturbation was very brief, um, and two to three orders of magnitude more brief than the full recovery of the marine event in pelagic environments. And one point I didn't make earlier, but there is a fauna, a mammalian fauna that occurs within the, um, just the very first part of the tertiary called the Puerkin North American land mammal stage, which is distinctly low in diversity and um, very um, limited in number, but, but most conspicuously low in diversity, which had previously been interpreted to possibly be an adaptive radiation of new forms. But the very brief time scale that we've now established for this, uh, which previously was about 500,000 years, now is so short that you can't possibly envisage speciation occurring on such a short time scale. And mammalian speciation takes, most people would, would agree, at least 100,000, if not 500,000 years. So this supports a minority, a previous minority view that these fauna were derived from immigration from elsewhere. I mean, it was just a reshuffling of existing taxa. And then a second level of conclusions that are um, more speculative uh, or perhaps less conclusive, and that is that there were significant climate oscillations and sea level fluctuations and biotic turnover even, which I haven't really talked about, that predated the Chicxulub impact. So, I mean, the paleontologists who claim that there were extinctions going on before the KT boundary are not crazy or stupid. I think that they're really, this is true. Um, and one thing you have to consider is that for most of the Cretaceous, the global climate was what was called the Cretaceous hothouse. There were anomalously warm climates, sea level was especially high. And so after this long um, period of great global warmth, climate fluctuations of the sort of magnitude that we've seen would be especially hazardous to 
to faunas and floras that were adapted to this super hot house uh, world. So we conclude that the Chicxulub impact was a coup de gras, um, that is, that was the, the final straw um, in, an, in an ecosystem that was in um, bad shape. And this represented a tipping point in, in ecological terms for what's called the state shift, the irreversible um, transition that may be caused by something that independently might not be as significant, but when it occurs on top of a number of other stressful conditions, sends things into an irreversible decline. And finally, in order to really sort out whether the Deccan traps had anything at all to do with, with uh, KP extinctions, we really need to date it with much greater precision than has been done. Okay, thank you for your attention.